Tonight, turbulent times. Boeing's Dreamliner becomes nightmare fuel for the company as whistleblower allegations spring up once more on lapses in build integrity. Historic meeting. Taiwan's former President Ma meets China's Xi, much to the surprise of global diplomacy. The ties between the two nations thinning following the election of a China out leader. Biden's bounds. The road to the White House sees a change in the neck and neck between Trump and Biden, with new polls confirming slow but steady progress in the Democrats' favor. And run, Rust, run! Is it a homage to an iconic movie or simply an immense act of kindness? Looks like it's both. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening. Thank you very much for tuning in. You're joining us on World News Tonight. We hope you're ready for some key updates from across the globe and we have quite a bit of ground to cover tonight from the floods in Russia to the climate crisis. But first, we start off with some updates on Boeing's plight. But there seems to be no end to the turbulence ailing the company as even more whistleblower claims continue to paint a weary picture. This time the focus is on its 777 and 787 wide body craft fleets as the company is accused of cutting corners for build quality and safety. Boeing faces a deepening crisis over its attitude towards safety and quality. On Tuesday, the Federal Aviation Administration confirmed it was investigating allegations by a whistleblower. Company engineer Sam Salepour says he saw unsafe practices in the production of widebody 787 and 777 jets. He says some parts were the wrong size and other areas of the planes didn't meet specifications. Salepour says Boeing used shortcuts to try to clear bottlenecks in output and ignored his warnings. At one point, he says he saw workers jumping up and down on bits of the planes to try to get parts to align. He says some practices put excessive stress on major joints in the aircraft. Boeing called the claims inaccurate and said it had full confidence in its products. However, the allegations come with the plane maker already in turmoil. They follow the mid-air blowout on one of its 737 MAX jets in January. The FAA has subsequently capped output of the planes, while Boeing takes steps to improve quality control. Salipour is now expected to appear before a congressional committee investigating the apparent quality lapses at Boeing. The engineer says he has faced retaliation by the company since he first raised his concerns. But moving on now to key stories in the region, it certainly is the election year as yet more nations follow through with their democratic processes. Today saw South Korea head to the polls for their parliamentary elections, which will impact the remainder of the Yoon administration's term. And the distribution of seats among parties will determine the trajectory of budget bills and legislation in the country. Vote counting is underway in South Korea as the country awaits the results of its parliamentary elections. The election is widely seen as a mid-term referendum on President Yoon sik yeols administration, who still has three years left in office. His People Power Party has struggled to achieve its agenda in legislature dominated by the opposition Democratic Party. Exit polls are projecting that the opposition will secure a majority of 300-seat parliament, though such polls have proved inaccurate in the past. In recent weeks, Mr. Yoon has been criticized for appearing to be out of touch with voters' inflation boosts. But the opposition has also faced similar criticism. If the exit polls prove accurate and the PPP fails to secure a strong representation, Mr. Yoon could leave office with little to show for his time other than his foreign policy achievements. And now over in China, a surprising display of diplomacy. Chinese leader Xi Jinping held rare talks with former president of Taiwan who supports closer ties with China, a highly unusual meeting just weeks before the democratic island swears in a new leader, Beijing openly loads. Meanwhile, the current Taiwan president Tsai Ing-wen visited Hualien to check on disaster relief efforts with not much acknowledgement on the meeting. 
Ma Inju, who led Taiwan from 2008 to 2016 and is currently in Beijing on a 11 day tour across China, met Xi today. The carefully choreographed movement is steeped in political symbolism. It's the first time a former president of Taiwan has been hosted by China's top leader in Beijing since 1949. It is also the first meeting between Xi and former KMT leader Ma since their historic summit in Singapore in 2015. But their reunion also highlights the widening political divide across Taiwan Strait and how Xi's ever more aggressive posture toward Taipei has driven more Taiwanese away from China. Ma's meeting with Xi also coincides with the frenetic week of diplomatic activity in Washington, where the President Joe Biden will host the first ever leaders' summit between US, Japan and the Philippines. We we'll move on to updates on the Israel-Palestine conflict now. While Eid has dawned on the Gaza Strip, there's not much cause for celebration as its inhabitants prepare in worry for impending invasions by Israeli forces. While President Joe Biden expressed concern over Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's actions, calling them a mistake, particularly regarding strikes on vehicles and personnel in Gaza. Here in the Jabalia refugee camp in northern Gaza, people prepare to mark Eid al-Fitr, the feast that ends the month-long observance of Ramadan. Amid the destruction, there is little cheer for Palestinians this year. There is no meaning for Eid from inside the shelter places, this man says. The devastated enclave is facing the risk of widespread famine and disease with nearly all of its inhabitants now homeless, about six months into Israel's air and ground campaign in Gaza which was triggered by Hamas's attack on southern Israel on October 7th. Israel says aid is moving into Gaza more quickly after international pressure, but the amount is disputed. The United Nations says it's still much less than the bare minimum to meet humanitarian needs. Hamas said on Tuesday that an Israeli ceasefire proposal delivered during talks in Cairo fell short of its demands, but the group said it would study the offer further and deliver a response to Egyptian and Qatari mediators. The talks have so far failed to reach a breakthrough in pausing the war. Hamas wants any agreement to secure an end to the Israeli offensive, a withdrawal of forces, as well as to allow displaced people to return to their homes. Israel wants to secure the release of hostages seized by Hamas in the October attack. Of the 253 people seized on October 7, 133 hostages remain captive. Residents said Israeli forces kept up airstrikes in central Gaza and Rafah on Tuesday. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu told military recruits the same day that Israel will, quote, complete the elimination of Hamas brigades, including in Rafah. He has said victory over Hamas required going into the southern city and that there is a date for the operation, despite Washington's warning not to go ahead. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says he expects the talks between Israel and U.S. officials to take place next week on that potential operation. There have been international pleas for restraint in Rafah, where over a million displaced civilians are holed up. And relating to the region's conflict, the UK's Foreign Secretary David Cameron has confirmed that the UK government will not suspend arms exports to Israel after the killing of seven aid workers in an airstrike on Gaza last week, as he insisted the UK would continue to act within international law. The statement comes following his discussions with US diplomat Antony Blinken and Cameron's previous talks with Donald Trump at Mar-a-Lago. For more on this, we have other than a world news special correspondent Clifford Pereira from Yorkshire in the UK. Clifford? Yes, I'm Rahul. Lord Cameron said ministers had grave concerns about humanitarian access in Gaza as he urged Israel to turn its commitments on aid into reality at a joint press conference with his US counterpart Anthony Blinken. Downing Street has come under mounting pressure from senior Tories to suspend weapons export in light of the growing humanitarian crisis in Gaza. During his visit to Washington, which followed dinner with Donald Trump at the ex-president's Mar-a-Lago resort in Florida, Cameron said he has now reviewed the most recent advice about the situation in Gaza and Israel's conduct of their military campaign. Cameron refused to be drawn on the details of his discussion with Trump after making a surprise visit to presumptive Republican presidential candidate's Florida resort. The visit formed a part of his push to show up U.S. support to Ukraine. Back to you, Anuradhi. All right, thank you very much. That was other there in the World News. Special correspondent Clifford Pereira from Yorkshire in the U.K.
We're going in for a short commercial break now. We'll be right back with more key global updates. Stay tuned. Welcome back. We continue our updates with the Dolores situation over in Russia. Russia and Kazakhstan ordered more than 100,000 people to evacuate after swiftly melting snow swelled mighty rivers beyond their bursting points in the worst flooding in the area for at least 70 years. The Ural River, Europe's third largest, burst through an embankment dam on Friday, flooding the city of Orsk just south of the Ural Mountains. Downstream, water levels in Orenburg, a city of around half a million, were rising with peak levels expected on Wednesday. As the Tobol River rises, people in the city of Kurgan have been warned to evacuate immediately, and Governor Vadim Shumkov urged residents to take the warning seriously. The wider region is home to around 800,000, with water levels in some parts of the Tobol rising 29 inches in just two hours. More than 19,000 people are at risk in Kurgan, the TASS news agency reported. Emergencies were declared in Orenburg, Kurgan and Tumen, a major oil-producing region of western Siberia. President Vladimir Putin has been monitoring the floods from Moscow, but anger boiled over in Orsk when at least 100 Russians begged the Kremlin chief to help and chanted shame on you at local officials who they said had done too little. The head of the Russian Ministry of Emergency Situations, Alexander Kurenkov, flew to Orenburg region on Tuesday to monitor the situation after being tasked to do so by Putin, the ministry said. The ministry added preventative measures are being taken and rescue teams have been strengthened. It was not immediately clear why the annual snow melt had made this year's floods so bad. Scientists say climate change has made flooding more frequent worldwide. And we've got updates for you on Trump's legal troubles now. No luck for Trump tonight as the former president lost his second last ditch bid in as many days to delay his April 15th trial on criminal charges stemming from hush money paid to a porn star. A full panel of appeals judges will later consider the challenge to the gag order. The trial judge imposed the order last month, barring Trump from verbal attacks on potential witnesses and others after finding he made statements in various legal cases that the judge called threatening, inflammatory and denigrating. In a statement, a spokesperson for Trump called the trial a witch hunt and said the legal team would continue to fight it. A separate judge on Monday denied Trump's request to delay the trial while he tries to move the case out of heavily Democratic Manhattan. A survey conducted by lawyers for the Republican presidential candidate found more than 60 percent of Manhattan residents thought Trump was guilty and 70 percent had a negative opinion of him. Trump is accused of covering up a $130,000 payment to porn star Stormy Daniels in exchange for her silence before the 2016 presidential election about a sexual encounter she said she had with Trump a decade earlier. He has pleaded not guilty to the charges. And on the road to the White House tonight, we see a turning of tables on public consensus. New polls found U.S. President Joe Biden has marginally widened his lead over Donald Trump ahead of the November presidential election as a Republican candidate prepares for the start of the first of four upcoming criminal trials. Some 41% of the 833 registered voters in a nationwide survey online said they would vote for Biden if the election were held today compared with 37 percent for Trump. That four-point lead was up from a one-point lead Biden held in a Ipsos poll in March. The poll also showed that many voters remain on the fence, with some 22 percent of registered voters in the poll saying they had not picked a candidate, were leaning toward third-party options, or might not vote at all. Biden had a smaller lead of just one point among all respondents, but his lead among registered voters is significant as people who are already registered to vote are more likely to cast a ballot in November. The poll included many ways to measure candidate support, most pointing to a close race. 
Nationwide surveys give important signals on American support for political candidates. However, just a handful of competitive states typically tilt the balance in the U.S. Electoral College, which ultimately decides who wins a presidential election. And now we've got some concerning climate updates for you. It seems that temperature statistics are now a broken record. As it was reported that the world experienced its warmest March on record, capping a 10-month streak in which every month set a new temperature record. The European Union Climate Agency Copernicus, or C3S, says March 2024 averaged 14.14 degrees Celsius, or roughly 60 degrees Fahrenheit. The global average temperature from April 2023 to March 2024 was 1.58 degrees Celsius above the average in the pre-industrial period. 2023 was the planet's hottest year in global records going back to 1850. And from a record number of wildfires in Venezuela to severe drought in South Africa, extreme weather and exceptional temperatures have wreaked havoc this year. C3S says the primary cause of the exceptional heat are human-caused greenhouse gas emissions. Other factors pushing up temperatures include El Nino, the weather pattern that warms the surface waters in the eastern Pacific Ocean. El Nino peaked in December and January and is now weakening, which may help to break the hot streak towards the end of the year. And on that very story, we have legal updates. Europe's top human rights court ruled that the Swiss government had violated the human rights of its citizens by failing to do enough to combat climate change in a decision that will set a precedent for future climate lawsuits. The European Court of Human Rights ruling in favor of more than 2,000 Swiss women who brought the case is expected to resonate in court decisions across Europe and beyond to embolden more communities to bring climate cases against government. And for updates on this, we have other than the world news special correspondent Chatra Jayendra from Stockholm in Sweden. Chatra? Yes, I'm Rani. Despite the victory, in a sign of the complexities of the growing wave of climate litigation, the court rejected two other climate-related cases on procedural grounds. One of these was brought by a group of six Portuguese young people against 32 European governments. The Swiss woman said their government's climate inaction put them at a risk of dying during heat waves. They argued their age and gender made them particularly vulnerable to such climate change impacts. In her ruling, court president Sephora Olire said the Swiss government had failed to comply with its own targets for cutting greenhouse gas emissions and had failed to set a national carbon budget. Swiss Federal Office of Justice which represented the Swiss government at the court took note of the ruling. The case before the 17th judge panel in Starburg, France, are among the increasing number of climate lawsuits brought by citizens against governments that hinge on human rights law. The verdict in the Swiss case, which cannot be appealed, will have international ripple effect most directly by establishing a building legal precedent for all 46 countries that are signatories to the European Union Convention on Human Rights. Back to you, Arradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than the world news special correspondent Chatra Jander from Stockholm in Sweden. Thanks again. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news right after this. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Now, if you would happen to recall a very heartwarming movie of the past, Forrest Gump, then you would definitely remember the iconic scenes in which the protagonist, Gump, took himself on a run that turned him into a national phenomenon. Well, life imitates art, it seems, as we saw one enthusiastic runner trek through Africa for a very honorable cause. 
This is way more than exercise. A 10,000 mile run up the length of the continent of Africa raised funds for people experiencing homelessness. 27-year-old Russ Cook documented his record-breaking journey on social media using the name Hardest Geezer. Day 155 of running the entire length of Africa, going for the longest day of the mission today, 67K deep. The mission, as Cook called it, was more than a jog in the park. So far on the mission, I've survived alone in the desert, a robbery at gunpoint, near death in the jungle, a brutal crash, heart infested waters, malnutrition, sickness and injuries. I've raised £241,000 for charity. The UK resident was met with government bureaucracy while running through Africa. At one point, obtaining visas almost stopped the journey. We have a bit of a problem. We haven't been able to get visas for Algeria and if we don't get them then it is game over for project africa just like the fictional forrest gump cook's run has attracted a lot of attention and after that i got more company and then even more people joined in and like forrest for the final leg of his challenge people from around the world joined in i was laying on my couch it was a sunday afternoon and i saw it and he said everybody can come. I literally got on Skyscanner, I looked for a ticket, and 20 minutes later I bought the ticket and here I am. In all, Cook raised almost $1 million for homeless youth and to bring clean water to some of the areas of Africa he ran through. And finally tonight, Peru's Andean Mountains may hold the secret to longevity and the world's oldest ever person if a new claim by authorities of a 124-year-old man born in 1900 are proven to be true. The country's government has claimed that local resident Marcelino Abad from the central Peruvian region of Huanuco is 124, which would make him, by distance, the oldest ever independently verified human. Peruvian authorities say that they're helping Abad apply to the Guinness World Records for independent verification. The Guinness World Records currently lists the oldest living man as a 111-year-old Brighton who got the title this month after the death of a Venezuelan man who was 114. The oldest living woman is 117, while the oldest person ever verified reached 122. Well, is it considered a blessing or a curse to have longevity? We might not live long enough ourselves to truly find out. Well, that's all the stories we've got to report to you on World News tonight. Join us again next time for more key updates from across the globe. Till then, good night.